What follows is a dramatic reenactment of the moment I learned about I.O. Euring. Okay, maybe that's not exactly how it happened, but it was close. And honestly, that's a pretty intense reaction to a system call. So, what does I.O. Euring do that justifies such a theatrical intro? Well, I could repeat that it's a high-performance, fully asynchronous I.O. kernel API, but that doesn't explain much. Instead, let's start from the basic read and write system calls and see why we need a whole new interface. I've already mentioned system calls twice, but I haven't explained what they are. For the purposes of this video, you can think of them as essentially the API to the kernel. Whenever an application needs to communicate with the outside world, it needs to ask the kernel to mediate through an API. That API is named system calls. Faster Than Lime did a really good video on how system calls work and how S-Trace can tell you which ones an application uses. It's really good and it does the topic a lot more justice than I ever could. Link in the description. The simplest way to ask the kernel to do I.O. on our behalf is with the read and write system calls. Whenever you use the read and write traits on a file, that's exactly what you're doing. Here, let me show you. We'll open a file, create a buffer, and call read to read some bytes, so we can print them on the screen. Run this program with strays, and you can see that there is exactly one syscall for read. That's it. Doing writes or working with network I.O. is exactly the same. The only thing that changes is the file descriptor. That seems pretty simple and understandable, so why do we need a different way to do I.O.? Well, there are a few reasons. One is that the read-write family of syscalls is synchronous. When an application calls them, it blocks until the operating system completes the request. This in turn means that to keep applications responsive and performant, we need a threading model on top which makes things complex. The other is that system calls are expensive, and there is only one way to deal with that cost. Do fewer of them. Attempts to solve both these problems were made with interfaces such as Paul, ePoll, and AIO. But they suffer from weird limitations, and they are not the simplest things to use, especially when compared with read-write. That's how we got I.O. Euring. It's asynchronous and designed in a way that allows the user to do heavy I.O. without any system calls. I know this sounds too good to be true, but it works, and here's how. The basic design consists of two ring buffers that are shared between the user space application and the kernel. The application adds an entry in the submission queue and notifies the kernel. The kernel removes the request, executes it, and adds an entry with the result in the completion queue, which the application can read at its convenience. This achieves both goals. It is asynchronous because the application doesn't block while the request is executed, but instead it will get the results in the completion queue. And it is efficient because adding some mission entries is not a system call, so the application can add as many as it needs before it notifies the kernel, amortizing the cost of each one. And how do we get to use this ring then? In Rust, a common way is the Uring crate from Tokyo RS. So, let's add I.O. Euring as a dependency and try to read a file. First, we'll need to create the ring with a fixed number of entries for each queue. Now we get to create the submission entries with our requests. Since it's read we want to do, we'll create a read SQE. We need to provide the file descriptor, the buffer to hold the bytes read, and the number of bytes. We can also set the user data field. This lets us add a custom value that will be copied in the completion entry for this request, so we can correlate submission and completion entries. By the way, yes, every kind of operation you may want to do has its own opcode and its own SQE. You can find them in the sources for Tokyo Euring, and as you can see there are lots, and not all are for I.O. Some are for controlling the ring itself, like adding files to poll or buffers to reuse. I'll call this advanced usage for now and not deal with it in this video. Once we're happy with our submission entry, we add it to the ring and then we need to let the kernel know. This call, as written, 
will block this thread until the completion entry appears in the queue. We could, of course, also just keep adding SQEs and notifying the kernel and let some other thread worry about ripping the completed I.O. This is a big departure from our previous example with vanilla read where every call blocked. Of course, in this specific example, none of this matters, since we are not doing any kind of multithreading. So we'll just block and wait for our read to complete. The final step is retrieving the completion entry. The most important bit in contains is the result value. You see, since all calls are asynchronous, the submission call cannot return errors. Instead, if anything went wrong, we'll know from the result field in the completion entry. In the CQE, we can also find the user data value from the corresponding SQE. Once we have verified there are no errors, our buffer should contain the result of the read, so we can go ahead and print it. And there you have it. We read the file with uring from Rust. If we take a look with strays, we'll notice a lot more system calls in the uring case. We have the IO uring setup call that creates the ring and a couple of mmap calls which are necessary to set up the ring memory shared between the kernel and our application. Then we have the enter calls for every operation we want to do. That doesn't seem more efficient than using classic read-write syscalls and it is definitely more complicated to set up. What's that all about? Well, you are right. If all we want to do is read chunks of a file or write some data out, Uring is not worth the trouble. Read-write will work much better and honestly it will probably be faster. But if you want to do some heavy-duty I.O., Uring is unbeatable. Here, let me show you something cool. Since the two queues are shared memory between user space and kernel, it could be possible for the kernel to monitor the submission queue constantly with a kernel thread and execute the entries as they appear, without the application needing to make a system call. This would mean the only system calls we have to do for I.O. are the Uring create and the two memory maps during setup, and nothing more. Well, that's exactly what the SQ poll option does. I'll create the ring again, but this time with the SQ poll option. The timeout value controls how long the kernel thread will stay awake after the last entry in processes. For this example, any value will do. The SQs remain the same, but now we don't need to submit. Instead, we just wait for the CQE to appear. If we S-trace this program, we'll see that after setup, there are no more system calls happening. Yep, we managed to read from disk without any system calls. And that covers the basic usage of Uring. But reading and writing files is not impressive. You know what's impressive? Reading and writing files really, really fast. And that's what the next video will be about. We'll do some benchmarks and maybe write a simple Uring server to see just how fast we can process I.O. on a simple desktop machine. Thank you for watching and I'll see you next time.